to execute the things that the protocols require to be executed in order for them to move forward. Okay. Because it was always assumed that things were centralized, that everybody would, you know, they'd be running on uh, their own computers first, their big server first. And, and then we went to, you know, um, distributed systems and they'd be running on someone's server and then they'd be running on a cloud and then they'd be running on a hybrid cloud and some on your server and then all of a sudden well they're just going to run everywhere and and now they're protocol based and because of that they'll run on my computer i'll mine or i'll you know stake if i have a reason to do it they'll run on my computer if i can earn something for doing that and so the protocol itself and this is something we've been working on in in Veris, is, the protocol itself needs to actually be able to carry with it the value required to pay for the reset sources that actually run to make it happen. And so that's kind of where, you know, a blockchain comes in and, and decentralized, everyone works in their own interest and it becomes secure because it all comes together and the aggregate, you know, makes that work. And so, yeah, I, 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 didn't really understand the part about protocols, but what I took from that is it's similar to how DNS works. Well, not really how DNS works, but how DNS is currently. Because your computer trusts that your router trusts a DNS provider that trusts another DNS provider that trusts another true. DNS provider. Identities in a way are, yes, true. Identities in a way are like that because if you know that you're looking at the right blockchain and it's registered properly on that blockchain, according to those consensus rules, you can verify signatures. You don't need a centralized authority to have a root of trust, even though the trust is decentralized. You just have to know. Go ahead. I, I can set up my own DNS server and then trick someone into using my DNS server and say, oh, Google's this other IP, which is actually my website that's trying to trick you. Right. The blockchain every every it's verifying itself right it's cryptographically verifiable that you know you're on the right blockchain or you're not and and so that's kind of that's the foundation of it but once you get past that then you have to start thinking about okay well how do i make a how do i send something you know to another blockchain for example if i'm going to ever have blockchains that can generate that's and that's kind of the big thing that we're trying to enable is it's not one blockchain necessarily to rule them all it's you know these protocols need to be developed further they're not done and you know if you look at ethereum and you say all right well you've got defi you know growing on ethereum and you've got these multiple currencies and and yeah guess what people want to do that you know the first killer app for ethereum was um I, ICOs really. I mean, that was the first killer app for Ethereum. Is raising money to do different things because it kind of cut out investors, and and the bigger investors said, "Well, we don't like to be cut out," and so you know that's just not okay. And and there was a lot of mixing of you know helping people, which was really important, and also kind of shutting down the chance to you know do that in some way that doesn't involve lots of lawyers and financial groups and underwriters and et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, now we've got this system that it's silos everywhere. You got, you know, people are brid building bridges. They're building like bridges to Ethereum. We're building a bridge to Ethereum, but our bridge is a little bit different and I'll explain it in a minute. And, and how will this compare to HTTP? Well, HTTP, you could run, um, you know, Electrum, blockchain or like a not blockchain but um cryptographic you know transactions over electrum which is over http but you know someone's got to run the server and there's no model for who gets paid for doing what they're doing now with blockchain when i send a transaction and it gets recorded somewhere anything gets recorded somewhere it cost me something to do that whether I'm a miner and I put it in so it, you know, cost me the space of another transaction that would pay a fee or it's a transaction itself, it pays a fee. 
And now with DeFi, you know, I'm a miner and I might want to front run somebody and extract some value out of a, a million dollar conversion that I see coming through on a DeFi transaction. You know, so I'm going to kick out a whole bunch of people and fees go up, you know, and and then people start trying to jump in front of other transactions and fees go up because it becomes kind of a different thing than just paying for the resources to run it and competing just for those resources. It becomes uh, a leak, you know, a value for minor extracted value on Ethereum. And so there's not yet a protocol that is, you know, that handles what's needed to actually transmit value around between systems and blockchains, central or decentralized systems, centralized or decentralized systems, that really is able to handle everything that's necessary. And so that's actually what, you know, that's what we're doing. And the, um, the way that it works is this. You need, so everyone thinks that DeFi, or not, I'm, I'm sorry, not everyone, but a lot of people think DeFi is just about trading and, you know, earning a yield. And it, these are kind of artifacts of the emergence of a new technology that, that people think that it's just for that. When in fact, we have DeFi built in, in the new, in the next version, the one that's on testnet now, and, and the one that's going to come out, DeFi is built into the protocol at the blockchain level, which means that when people do conversions, there's a, you know, a standard like percentage of what you're converting that goes to people holding the currency that you're converting through, as well as um, miners and stakers of the blockchain. And the, re and the way it's a, a, a low price because it's actually efficient to do because all transactions are solved simultaneously, like, uh, at simultaneously, like it's a simultaneous solution um, for each currency in a single block. So, if, so all of conversions, you know, say if you have a, a tri currency that has Dai and Ethereum and Varus, and it's called Tri Coin, and so you can convert between Dai, Ethereum, and Varus and Tri Coin using that currency, and all of the conversions in one block are processed at the same time now at the same time fees for all of these different processing um, currencies are converted they, they're converted to Varus and paid out to miners and stakers in Varus so miners and stakers actually just treat creating these blocks similarly they validate everything they get paid in Varus but the protocol actually makes sure that as more and more volume and transactions flow over the blockchain. Number one, there's no front running in the, you know, it's resolved in the protocol. So the miners don't extract value, but the miners also have this incentive to just process the whole flow of transactions because they're the, the protocol aggregates them. So what that means is that even the fees and these micro conversions that you can't really do if you're trying to do it through, say, Uniswap, and you got to pay all the Ethereum fees, you can convert, you know, less than cents from one currency to another as part of uh, cross-chain transactions. So imports and output and and uh, and exports, imports and exports, and because of this in the protocol. There's a generic way to be able to um, send currencies between Varus or other PBAS chains that will be part of the Varus multi-chain network and other blockchains like Ethereum. And, and the fees can be converted to the native currency of the source or the destination actually by either side as part of the way that that works. And so every, and you can actually, in the way the protocol works, it allows multiple hops. So you could literally have, you know, a transaction that you send 
that say goes from Cardano to Veris converts its fee currency that it takes with it to Ethereum and then, you know, converts into BAT because it's the best conversion deal for say Cardano to BAT is on the Veris network and then ends up going to Ethereum, you know, away from the more secure IDs um, to someone's Ethereum address. And, you know, that means that any blockchain that connects to a system that can do this can actually send transactions that can bounce through that system to any other connected system as well. And these transactions that this protocol um, covers the requirement that these transactions carry with them what um, actually Nick has described before as energy, you know, because it literally is some value that can, as it travels from one system to another based on this protocol, could in fact convert between different currencies and which currency it is matters less than kind of how much the value is intrinsically worth. And that is what pays for the computing resources of this to actually happen. And now uh, once you and once you can enable something like that, you can enable something way beyond what HTTP or other protocols have ever been able to enable because to actually process a transaction is worth doing for just about anybody who connects to the network. And it creates this entire kind of humanity-wide open marketplace for a network that does the right thing. So I'll stop there. Uh, just a follow-up question, just to sum it, maybe just to make sure that I'm understanding, to simplify it for my for myself, is the various protocol is meant to bridge different blockchains, so to execute things a little bit more streamlined that could essentially be something that more useful, I guess. Is that am I understanding this right, or did I? The, the original, so if you look at back at the original vision paper, the Veris vision paper, it, you know, it describes public blockchains as a service. And the idea is that, you know, this is just technology that everybody can use. It's really decentralized technology. And how do you make a network that of blockchains that can scale to the world, you know, uh, someone someone mentioned a limit. I don't want to say the name of the identity system. Someone mentioned a limit of an identity system as having, you know, 50 million or, or so names. I mean, with the protocol that we have, there's not a limit. There's like, it can be trillions or more. That trillions is a small number for the number that you could have. And, and the, the, um, it's, it's basically that uh, you can scale by enabling people to create their own independent thing and having a protocol that allows them to connect. So public blockchains as a service, you know, it, the implication is that each blockchain actually has a, a fair amount of value built into it. Like Veris ID, every blockchain that will be in the PBAS network will have the ability to, you know, issue its own IDs. Now, every blockchain will also be able to set a price for importing and recognizing IDs from another blockchain. That's, you know, um, and, and but if somebody creates a blockchain, they can also create DeFi currencies on that blockchain using the same protocol, you know, and those, they, in fact, um, in the, in the new uh, PBAS, uh, release that's coming up when you create a pbas currency that means you're creating a chain that's going to launch and and you're effectively you know you're either advertising it or it might just be a chain that you're using for someone mentioned you know corporate um use it might just be an internal chain you're using for workflow of ids because now you've got ids and signatures for everybody in your company that you can do pretty much for free because you make a chain and you don't have to pay you know, for various IDs and everybody's got a verifiable ID and, you know, you might not really consider that chain a public chain, but you can just run it on your internal PCs in your company. And, and, uh, and so 
the network that you that you end up with is a completely decentralized kind of fractal model but each so we're not if you say is it that we're just trying to bridge networks no but it's always been part of the vision as as a requirement i don't believe in silos of technology being able to serve what everybody needs in the world and you you know i actually tried to send um a transaction four times today you know on ethereum uh and three times it was canceled um because it was actually going to a contract that wasn't you know was supposed to be an address for somebody and the contract was charging more and taking the transaction charging the fee it didn't have enough gas and it was failing you know because fees are kind of going out of sight if fees start to get too high on one system people should have another and so on veris if veris gets too busy you know and fees get too high then there will be more pbas chains that will have all of the same kinds of capabilities and they'll be able to be connected you know and the and the system just grows and if people want to do uh polls or elections you know because we've talked about privacy and there's zero knowledge then you can make you know multiple um chains to cover really any amount of population that you want to have involved and if you talk about transactions per second well you know with the upcoming release i mean you can you have interoperable chains you can choose from the network of all available chains to merge mine up to you know if you've got the memory and the computing power up to 22 chains on the same hash power and uh you know the network can really have kind of an unlimited number of chains so it all of a sudden isn't something like polka dot where you need centralized pieces you need centralized uh you know hubs or things like that or or different um it's just a protocol that allows this to work because all of the pbas chains are actually quite similar to an ethereum chain in the way that a veris chain might view them and they also may view veris similarly to Ver you know the way veris might view other chains they're all kind of independent um but interoperable and and connected systems and i think that's where we're going in the long run because right now we can already see that every single you know one size fits all um solution doesn't fit all and everybody learns as we're going we learn how to make better and better systems application models develop you know we learn how to make things easier you know i think max i heard max oh, i'm sorry uh hmm. I, oh yeah i i heard him talking about um uh the card metaphor that they came up with for the wallet i love it like i i think it's beautiful you know you, the the challenge is you now have multiple networks like you got ethereum it supports all these different coins you got veris that will soon support an unlimited number of currencies you know you've got other networks that support many coins and then you've got multiple ids you've got a uh you know uh there's going to be a wallet and and i don't want to steal any thunder from nicholas but you know there's nicholas what can i talk about that or not yeah uh, well i wanted to just uh drop him with a few things because there's now uh yeah, a whole stop. No, 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 uh, no, not at all, not at all. I Is this the guy, to, Nicholas? Yeah. So, so I wanted just to introduce Michael. Mike, we call he calls me Nick. I call him Mike. Um, Michael in the room, and I wanted to give you Mike uh, an idea. So Joseph is the chap that was talking about Cardano, and I think there's some interesting questions, and you know, you heard my thoughts on on that. Wow. You have Sam who has um, a, a great interest in uh, cryptography in general. 
You uh-huh. have Jim, who has been following along uh, as one of the as one of the Ethereum uh, ETH lizards that we've been in the room with. We have Nilesh at the bottom, who's from uh, PayPal Venmo, and also used to be at your alma mater, Microsoft. Okay. We have okay. Eric, who hosts uh, Crypto Coffee, and he was trying to set up an ID last night. And we have um, Sam, who was talking about I- IDs, and he's working with. Um, um, uh, the um, uh, Craig Wright's crowd. So, um, so just to give you some sort of dimensions of the room and who's in here, and that you know, I think you're doing it obviously and always an amazing job in explaining things. But anyone wants to ask questions of Mike, this is the this is the time. This is one of the most. I mean, by background, maybe Mike, you want to give everyone a quick background as to 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 you and and a lot of people who are in the audience don't know who you are. Uh, necessarily, and uh, your background as a Microsoft technical fellow and all of that good stuff. Oh, okay. I, I mean, uh, so I'll give, I'll give a little background. Sure, just the the public stuff about my background. So yes, I was a Microsoft technical fellow. I was one of the um, I was one of the founders of .NET, one of the two recognized founders of the .NET platform and the common language run, runtime that was the project that I started there, you know, um, and I also actually prior to that started the Microsoft Java, uh, vir- Java machine, virtual machine system, and was um, one of the original authors of Microsoft Java virtual machine, actually. And, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to skip through a few things. And uh, Colonel Dev lead on Windows 95 and... Um, and then uh, built large big data systems for uh, big advertising, Microsoft advertising, where I really got, you know, an appreciation for the kinds of of data privacy issues that I thought mattered. And um, then was CTO for Parallels, building systems for telcos, you know, application provisioning and deployment for their customers worldwide. and. Um, and then, uh, took a little detour into, uh, patenting some nanomaterial chemistry and then came back to work on AI and, uh, did consulting and built some, uh, AI systems that again, oh, actually now I'll stop and give a little more detail because, so I started by uh, actually, this is part of the genesis of at least my involvement in Ferris. Um, I, I built a machine learning system for a client, a large company making an email system that um, they wanted it to be able, or, or taking an existing large email system and, and making a new version of it. And they wanted it to be able to have, you know, smart folders that would work similarly to the way that Google's do, but where people could kind of start organizing things. It would learn how you like to organize things and it would recognize, you know, financial and travel and spam and different, but, you know, they obviously have different uh, filters for spam as well. But the general idea was automatic categorization of everything. And so I built this, um, this AI system that could read a 60 word, this is, you know, before working on Verus, could read a 60 word uh, email in like 250 microseconds and make a lot of sense of it and, you know, figure out who the author was and figure out who, I mean, to, you know, reasonable confidence, um, figuring out lots of stuff about it. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I could use this if there was a way to actually get training data that you could trust from people this could be used to actually do some good if you could really get not that like that if it would be owned by the people and you get data from people but how would you be able to do that well the only you know thinking about it the only way i could come to was that you could you know blockchain was really a way to get people involved and to have them be able to remain um, self-sovereign and have privacy while at the same time uh, use 
the ID concept and, and to allow them to prove different things about themselves that would then be able to create, you know, uh, confidential, verifiable and transparent kind of the Holy grail of, you know, of polls and elections. And you can, and you can go back and all this stuff's kind of talked about in the, in the original vision paper. But, um, that was what, you know, and it's like, okay, it's going to be a fairly long road to get there. But in the long run, what, um, Nick talks about and what I'm hearing in the, I mean, that's kind of where we're going in a way that, that does preserve your self sovereignty, that does preserve, you know, some level of privacy, truly creating, <coughs> establishing privacy for yourself in your life is, is like probably right now theoretical. I mean, no matter how many privacy tools you've got, you know, it's the leaks that matter. So, um, you know, we, we're not going to make it, our goal is not to make it worse and to provide tools for privacy that you can leverage and use. Um, you know, and I, I think that's pretty much the best anyone can do right now. And so I, I think I actually got off on a little bit of a, a tangent on that. And so, um, the question started from, you know, what are, are we just bridging networks? And I think as an ETH, we, I heard that he was described as an ETH lizard. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that was meant in the most affectionate way. So, yeah, we have a, we have a group that's, uh, is the, is the DeFi, uh, Degen, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the I DeFi degens wear yeah. a skin of a lizard to show that they are uh, to show that they're they they're, they're traders as well as uh, ah, okay, cryptographers. Sure. So I would just think of it this way: from an Ethereum perspective, when this goes live with the ETH bridge, you're actually going to be able to think about the Varus DeFi network as the Varus network as you know kind of the uber all defi contract system because you're literally you're literally going to be able to to send a transaction from ethereum across the bridge to Verus, have it go through at its 0.05 percent rate and then come back or or not or you know either way or the other way around too you'll be able to send from uh Verus at first on the first bridge you're going to be able to send from Varus any currency on Varus, whether it's originating on Ethereum or, or it's just a Varus currency. You're going to be able to send that over to Ethereum and it'll pop out as an ERC-20 token. But um, in the first incarnation, we're not making it a requirement that you can then have it automatically go into a DeFi contract and do something and then come back. But that will be possible. That's possible in the protocol. And so we will be able to do that on the um, sending it into Varus and back because it's just a little bit easier because everything's a little more standardized and at the protocol level. But so for Ethereum, I think, you know, in a way, Varus is like, they can help Ethereum. And it's, it's, you know, it can be looked at in a number of different ways. Depends on how you want to look at it. It can also be conceivably, you know, a, an outlet for the fees and scalability and things like that for Cardano. If you think about Cardano, I know that um, you guys are bridging to Ethereum, but you know, anyone who bridges to Varus actually gets the ability to use it for bridging to anyone else who bridges to it as, as well. So there might be some real value there because that's kind of also built in. We should talk about that at some point. So I'll stop again and let you guys must have some questions about, well, you might not. And, that's okay. Mike, I was up till 5.30 in the morning last night just trying to l learn the language of this system. And it's, th th there's, th there's a lot that is, is, is so alien to just the, the, the way of thinking that we've, uh, that we've fell into from everything starting from Bitcoin and and how its security model uh, is presented. Um, I think the the I'm strangest. Sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Can you be more specific? Because I'm wondering if that because I heard you saying something about this before, and I'm wondering 
if what you're describing is really just that could be resolved maybe really quickly, because I think it might be simpler than you might think, actually. Well, we were just having, we, I don't know how long you've been here, but we, ha we were just having this conversation about how these types of understanding these systems, it's not as if the other system isn't, uh, isn't simple, it's just it's difficult to learn a different language. So right. let, let, me try to, let me try to put the problem of understanding to you as, as I see it. So from, it, it, it's basically, it seems to me that ownership over an address in Verus, the, the security model for you, the, the real person, to have ownership over an address in Verus is not just using the here's your private key keep it safe paradigm but it's based on some kind of social graph oracle oh, no, thing no, no, is, no, is no. that no 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 we so okay this is what i think is going on i think that it, you're thinking that it's more complicated than it is actually because here's the way it works we just have the normal address it's like a bitcoin address so we have normal bitcoin addresses they're really just the you know, the public key hash um, that same as what Bitcoin uses, different start byte. So you end up with an R address and that is the transparent address. Then we have the same kind of a zero, zero knowledge proof address as what um, Zcash has. So we have the Z addresses, you know, and they're the, the sapling style, sapling or later style Z addresses. And, and is this, does this address fork sort of from the first address in like a hierarchical deterministic type way? Or are these two you know, separate the, the, key pairs? The high, the, they're, they're, so we do have a wallet that allows you to, to just use one. We actually haven't released our uh, light wallet for private uh, zero knowledge addresses yet, but we have it. And, um, and, and it's just, you know, working on the release with cards and all that stuff. And so the, um, the uh, current wallets, the native wallets, it's the same as the way Zcash does it, where it's different key pairs. And so you have you know, any number of key pairs in your native wallet, but on the light mode wallet, you use the same seed typically, but the new light mode wallet will allow you to have hierarchically determined. Actually, actually no, uh, it has it built in, but I think we're not going to turn on the multi z address hierarchical deterministic um generation at first but anyways that's that's kind of more of i don't know i think of more of as a detail because it's more of like a um your wallet you really need to think of it because uh historically it did not have a hierarchically deterministic uh key generation for the transparent address it still doesn't and you need to think of it as just a collection of your keys okay but it's your wallet, like just like a Bitcoin wallet, and and then you have um, IDs. Now IDs are like uh, it's it's an address, but it's not a public private key pair. Are you there? Yeah, oh, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. So so it's basically it's an address, but it's um it's an indirection okay is what, what do you really mean by that is. well because if you revoke it then all the money that is uh, attributed to that address becomes inaccessible until it's recovered oh okay you know? okay but uh, so, slow down so 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 okay i have a I have a key pair and or, okay, so I can have no, one so set of keys, idea, just so normal think key. Of, think of an ID as a record on the blockchain controlled by a set of uh, three identities, one of them being itself, and each identity has a primary set of controlling addresses, which are normal addresses, transparent addresses. So if I make an ID, the easiest way that I, you know somebody might make an ID is a one-to-one -one mapping. I take an address, I control my ID with that address. All right? Now, if I lose the key for that um, ID, then I think uh, 
Roddy described it earlier, and I don't know if you were on then or not. Um, but if I lose the key from my address, I also have two other authorities for every ID. They can be self or they can be other IDs. Now, every ID can be multi-sig, but we're just talking about unisig right now. So the other IDs can be a revocation and a recovery ID. The revocation, so, so now let's talk about what the three authorities can do. There's primary authority, there's revocation authority, and there's recovery authority, okay? The three authorities can do the following. Primary authority can spend, can sign, and no one else can do that, okay? Um, recovery author or revocation authority has exactly one power. It can revoke. It can, it can turn the ID off and revoke. Basically, that's it. And then it loses all power over the ID once it does that. So you could give that to a company, for example, and still not centralize your identity. And they could have great fraud, you know, AI-based fraud protection and all that stuff. And they just revoke. And that could be a service. Now, recovery, once the recovery has the power that once an ID is revoked, then it has total power over the ID. And so all of these are independent IDs. They can all be multi-sig or unisig. And they are defined, the controller of those are defined by the addresses that you put in them. And they're, you can update them. You can transfer them. You can take you know 2,000 UTXOs or right. two, a million and transfer them to someone by just transferring the ID to them. Mike, can you sorry? Just can you unpack the recovery, uh, the recovery one a bit? You kind of uh, sped through that one. Well, they, uh, recover. So once an ID is revoked, it doesn't go away. It's just revoked. So so now, revoked is just kind of a state in which the primary right. ID can't control it anymore. Right. The primary okay. authority doesn't the primary control authority. It anymore. Right. And, and point, once it's the in this revoked state, has total control over it, and it can just redefine it. Okay, so so once the okay, so I I have this ID, everything's going fine, uh, and then I, maybe I lose the keys to it. So I go to my, I talk to the person who has my revoke, or, or, or I might it also have it. Just like uh, you could just actually have revoke, really a fairly, it's a lower security thing because. All it can do is turn it off and your recovery could be buried, you know, in your backyard, you know. Right, right, right. Okay. So Never something goes wrong. Goes to the network. So something so I, I it might be it might be very easy to right. Okay. So it's a low so the revoke is a lower security thing that I can give to kind of, you know, family, maybe even friends. And if something goes wrong, I trigger the revoke. Now once once an ID has been revoked, the primary can't access it and the only thing the only thing that has any power over it now is the recovery ID. The revoke ID can't unrevoke it. Is that correct? Right. Correct. Okay. So, okay, just let me let me just pause for a second. So, let's let's call I don't know the, the bait. Let's call the the key the key pair the private key pair that you actually need to kind of do key management in the standard Bitcoiny way. Let's just call them base keys. So you. So well, these, I, we just call them transparent addresses. That's what we call them. Oh, so okay. And that can apply to any blockchain, really. Okay, so you have the the transparent address, which is your regular Bitcoiny like key, and then yeah. you have your your zero knowledge. You call them zero knowledge address. Yeah. Well, we just call them as the address, but yeah. And the okay. zero knowledge address is an, is something that you can just attach to your ID as an endpoint. It doesn't control your ID. Right. So you can okay. publish a zero knowledge address and you can actually people can send to it like you could send, you know, something to my address by saying, you know, Mike at colon private. That's going to be my published zero knowledge address. Right. OK, so so both of these. OK, so so, so what is the difference? How, how do the how does the, the transparent address and the Z address interact differently with these, uh, with, with these identities? Well, the Z address is not a controlling address. It's, it's not a primary. End, it's not a primary address. It's, an, it's a zero knowledge endpoint that you're publishing. And in fact, the ID protocol allows you to have multiple of them, but we're only just using one right now.
Well, you um, could say that, but it's not. It's 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 not an address. It's not an address in the sense you're thinking of. It's a it's an index entry. Think of it that way. That indexes to the latest ID record. Sorry, one one more time. Can you can you repeat that? Think of it as an index entry that indexes into the latest ID record for that ID. And yes, it's always deterministic because it's always going to have the same entry. But you might change the primary addresses, the controlling transparent addresses, and then it will be like you might. Um, I, I would tell you something new, but I want to get things covered that you're already trying to understand before I move on to the next thing. So I'm going to. Maybe someone else has has some Sam, questions. Did you set it up last night? I, I got my name registered, and that's kind of where I'm at at this point. You did it, Eric. Well done. I, I can't tell you I did it right. All I know is I have Eric at, and it's there, and it seems to be associated. So, Mike, I introduced Eric, who's at the bottom there, to uh, Paris last, basically last night, and he managed to get his ID. Oh, great. Um, hey, I'm going to switch headphones. Hold on a second, and then I want to hear more about the ID. Just so. Well, while he does that, does anyone, can anyone here that's kind of coming from the kind of functional side of things give a, uh, you know, try to do, give a, a concise translation of, of how you would think of this after listening to all of it? I can give it a go. Go for it. Okay, so I think the ID concept is kind of like a namespace. Correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. He's just getting uh, some uh, changing his headphones. So yeah. Yeah. well, yeah, just just go ahead and and tell us like how yeah, just tell us the story that that you've made I'm in your mind to explain this. Uh, I I just have one question before I do that, uh, Michael. So just checking. So the original private public key pair. If you lose your private key, you lose everything, right? In the original one, yeah. Yeah. So basically. That's still the same, like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Everything. No, 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 no. You do, you don't lose everything with your ID if you lose your private no, no, key. No, 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 no. Hang on, step back. Oh, okay. Yes, sorry. Before, Go ahead. Yes. Yes, did, correct. Then yes. If that's what I didn't know. establish an ID. If you lose your private key, it basically is the same as with. Correct. Bitcoin. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So that's one thing I wanted to clarify because there was this notion that you couldn't, which isn't correct. So the wait, primary, wait. the primary. What, I said something that wasn't correct. No, not you, not you. It was oh. a, a previous conversation we we're having. So the notion that you can recover a private key to a different, you know, key address is different, right? So okay. Oh yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, okay. So we we settled that. We settled that it's not actually you. You still can lose your private key, which again fundamentally is your keys to the kingdom. So can um, I just no, it's you? not your keys to the kingdom any longer. Well, now it's you know, now it's your electronic key card to the king, kingdom yeah, that you can you change. An ID. Before you set up an ID. Okay. Yeah. So can I just check um, the IDs? Are they equivalent to like a namespace system? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, first, to the best of my ability, let me try to. Explain it to everyone else who's probably as confused as always, right? So effectively, what you're doing on the system is you're getting your private key. You're effectively creating what's a hierarchy of uh, namespace. Uh, it's, it's a concept that I've looked at in the past where effectively, so if you think of it in terms of a uh, chat, let's, let's change the context and just imagine you set it up in terms of a chat app, right? It's the concept where you create a index, like an admin account for a particular chat room, right? And so because you basically created that, that index, that, that chat room, right? Which is your index, which is your you know, ID. You can set up administrator account, you can set up a revoke account, and you can set up a recovery account. Basically, there's three basic types of accounts that you can set up in your chat app. So the chat app has a chat reference ID, which is your index ID. And then under that, you've got a natural hi hierarchy of attrib uh, attributable accounts, like your admin for your chat room. Does that make sense? 
does that, does that analogy still stick, Michael? Well, the, the only difference is that when you start talking about any traditional chat app or things, oh, then, as an analogy, to help as, an, an, as an analogy, but it starts to, I, I start feeling the centralized, decentralized divergence, but I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll wait. Okay, cool, cool. So just, so if you understand what the system is doing from a just general concept, if you shift it as a chat, chat app, that's effectively what you're doing. You've got the ability to create a chat room, which is your ID, which then has a main account, your admin account, a revoke account, right? And a recovery account, which is three default options that you can either assign to one or many addresses. That's what I've got so far, basically. In terms of just a very simple understanding of this, you know, addressing and revocable primary uh, recovery in yeah that, that concept the okay so the the recovery the primary and the uh the revoke that part makes sense to me all that that sounds like a really smart kind of game theoretical way where you can have you know control revocable recoverable control of this thing yeah. what i so, can't wrap my head around is how your uh, i'm sorry michael i have to use this language how your base bitcoiny key pair how that um what is the relationship between those where if you lose the key, you lose the, the key pair? What is the relationship between those and these IDs to which have these revoke, recover, and primary um, uh, system to? Oh, I see. All right. So let me just say how you're, do you develop on, on code or on, I mean, I'm no. trying to, okay. So, um, all right. When we, when the blockchain, uh node gets a transaction that is supposed to be signed by a particular id or if you get a file that's supposed to be signed by a particular id okay you would create a hash which uniquely identifies all of the thing that's supposed to be signed and you would ensure that it was signed in a standard kind of a multi-sig based on the ID at the block at which the signature was intent was claimed to be valid. You so so it's like you can be revoked, for example. Or so you would validate that the just as you do in Bitcoin, for example, but or similarly pretty much yeah similarly that the signatures if you had a uh, three of five id with five controlling addresses that you had three unique signatures of three of those controlling addresses and if so then that's a valid spend and if you um if you had just a single primary address controlling the id then really you need a signature from that single primary address to spend an output to that ID, unless the ID is revoked, you change the primary address, you change the primary address, all of a sudden every output before it can ever be spent by that ID must now be signed by the new address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's it's it, an ID is in a, is a multi-sig address to which uh, for which the multi-sig um, ruling is is such that it the, the the individual multi sigs give you this primary revocable and recovery effect correct mm, when you say the individual may i jump in here please yeah okay, can i just sure. jump hey, beautiful because this will also help me understand if i'm understanding this now i think part of the reason it's difficult is because it is a different paradigm and it's also i think for me why it might be a bit easier for me to understand is because i actually don't understand the technicalities but I'm seeing it in the concepts and I'm trusting that the technicalities are doable. Um, but, and that's another story. So in conceptually here, what's happening is that you have an index. That was the word that was used in a beautiful sense. It's an, in, it's an index. It's a piece of information, whatever that information is. And that's why it can be used by corporations or whomever, and they could just revoke it. And some next person takes it and all that. Like it's, it's beautiful anyway. Okay. So, so you have an index and you were asking, uh, I think Sam, how those base pairs relate to the index. 
So I think, and this goes back to what I think Joseph was asking about, like, oh, you know, if you lose your pairs, then you lose that address or whatever. But and I think the reason why Mike was seeming like, yes, but it doesn't matter in a certain way. And Mike, please, you will expand on this after. So, so what's happening here is that it's an index and you have these base pairs that are correlated to that index. And then you have uh, the ability to correlate other base pairs to, an index, to the same index. And those base pairs have different functionalities, and we've already outlined them as the three primary authorities. Oh, oh, wait! Now it's mixing up IDs and base pairs. The sorry, three, sorry. Th that's okay. Go ahead. Oh, if you wanted to clarify something there, but the uh, three, the three authorities, each one is actually an ID. Yes. Yes. Primary addresses. Those have their own index, effectively. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, exactly. Cool. Like it's, and that's where you get into t things like fractals. I think a little yes, bit more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it like blow. I. I. I can't. I can't keep up. But uh, it's so interesting. Okay. So. So yeah. Uh, I think that's basically it. And then. And I don't. Like that's basically it. That's actually structure. basically it. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Yes. Someone did it simply. If I if I can simplify, effectively, what you've done. If you created a um, almost a parent-child hierarchy of indexes, that's basically all you've done, and you've defined three standard child indexes of each parent, what you call identity index. That's Honestly, when you describe it that way, it might it might be conceptual. It so starts to sound more complicated than it is in its implementation. So I'm not. Well, but, us, but conceptually, conceptually, that's the that's maybe. The so, so, so the way, okay. So the way to think about it Sam, mm -hmm. is this, right? Right now, if you do, if you want to do something like a multi sig right, you do it with the base pair, the you know private uh, private public pair, right? What he's trying to do is basically shift the focus of the addressing to the base pair and uh, mm -hmm. you know deterministic wallet instead to an address that is associated to an index. Which allows you to obfuscate and provide more security and assurance through doing things like multi sig You can do multi sig on the index, which then removes, you know, the need to expose the effectively the primary public private keys and hence the addresses by shifting it to the addresses of the index. And so then you can basically like the concept of fractals. You can then drill down as much as you want until you let get to a level of kind of like a depth that you're comfortable with or that you know fits your uh, use case oh nice can i jump in here and i just want to say please join the Verus discord uh, there's so much information and more room for like uh learning and better understanding and I just want to respect uh, Mike. Mike's time here. He's he's like here to answer questions, and he did mention m that he had more to share with us. And I'm just like yearning for a bit more. So, Mike, if you did have something else that you wanted to share with us, I would be really appreciative. Well, did did everyone? I mean, I think was it Sam? I, I someone had a uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't know exactly who it was. Um, sounded like they still had some challenges with the. With the model, did that address everybody's kind of understanding of it or not? I didn't quite get there, and I think, Mick Joseph, can you define what you mean by index? It's, and I think that's the one thing I'm missing in that analogy. Maybe Nicola. Maybe maybe let Mike just explain it uh, again in the context that you know Giuliano and Joseph have given. Just let Mike go again. All right. So when when I so we have a different we, we call them smart transaction outputs and you can output to an ID is a valid recipient so is an address but an ID is a valid recipient of a transaction output and the I if an ID is a recipient of a transaction output then literally the index is used to map to the ID record that is used to determine which pri which uh, signatures, which keys must be used to validate the cryptographic signature that would be considered valid for this ID. 
and everybody on the blockchain gets the same answer. So it basically is an indirection from the ID to the signatures that you need to verify in order to validate a spend. Um, whatever those addresses are in that ID record, that ID record is an output of a transaction. It's like an unspent ID output. And that means it exists, and that is the record that is most recently valid on the network, the unspent ID output. And you can modify that unspent ID output if you have, you know, if you have the primary authority. You cannot change the, um, uh, actually, I'd, yeah, you cannot change the revoke and recover authority. I, I'd have to go back and actually look at the exact rule. But basically, you can't you can't get around the fact that if you took someone's private keys, they can take everything back from you. And then the thing, does that help at all, Sam? Yes. Y y y yes, it, it does. And I, I, I'm realizing now, I think that maybe uh, part of the difficulty I'm having is that I, I don't really understand the UTXO model from a very deep, uh, in, in a very deep way. And I think that that's kind oh, of required to right. understand it might have something that might saying. be related yes. to that because, so in, okay, just real quickly. So every output just, it's just made and then just stays on the blockchain until it's spent. And every output is, is to a specific address. And, you know, or, or a script hash, but it's basically an address. And so, um, and so an output on a normal, like Bitcoin or other UTXO style blockchain, um, you know, the way that you validate that that spend is valid is you must present the evidence that is a signature or that properly executes the script, but that is a signature for that output. And there is no indirection. So if you use a key, then the thing that it spends to is a key and it will and if you lose the private key you're done there's no there's no second chances and that carries all the way through pretty much to every blockchain they just kept doing that and what we've done is we basically said an id is an indirection so now you actually get a chance to change it and then there are specific rules that you know i remember coming up with this model because I had been working on IDs for decades, actually, like literally, I'm, you know, and, and I remember coming up with this concept and realizing how simple it was and how powerful it was. And it actually bothered me a lot because it, it absolutely meant that we had to change the way that we were doing certain things that, you know, that was good that we changed. But the bottom line is that, um, you effectively have now this indirection that, so if I have, you know, a million transaction outputs all spent to my company and it's, and I've got a company ID and someone buys my company, I don't have to pay a million fees to move all of those assets. And I don't have to clog the blockchain with a million transactions to do it either. I just simply get to move the ID to that other company that bought the company. And all of a sudden they have all the assets behind it. And when we are multi-currency, they'll have all the assets stored behind it, you know? And I think someone mentioned inheritance. So as long as we're covered on that, I'll add the next thing. And this is what we call Veris Vault. And that's actually, in, it's on testnet today. It's been working great. That'll be out in the next major upgrade. And what that does is it just adds another. So now that we understand the general kind of, some, I, I hope, Wait, Sam. Uh, yes. Sam? Okay. So, so essentially, what the um, what an ID is is it's it, it's an address uh, or it, it's a key in the standard UTXO way of things, but you've slipped this um, primary re uh, primary revoke recovery ruling in the middle of what we think of as the normal yeah. 
um, UTXO transaction. Sure, and it's a name that you that you get, and it's yours. You don't pay rent for it. It's yours. You don't pay an annual fee. Yes, you can squat, but it's blockchain. It's yours. Yeah. And um, you've got your, you know, every human can get a signature, a digital signature, without having to pay DigiSign or DigiCert or, you know, every Michael, year to have, have their Yeah, go ahead. Is this meant for everybody? Like, is this something that I should be getting my 75-year-old mother to participate in? Am I missing the high level? Well, literally everyone, but your 75-year-old mother is probably going to still always be able to have one. So she doesn't need to probably rush out and be an early adopter, you know, because it like for people who care about really having a part in what's in how this will evolve, then, you know, yeah, it's probably a good idea to, to, start using it and get familiar with it. But for people who are clearly not going to be using like, so here's an example. Um, uh, Nick, can I, can I talk about the, the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. mobile? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, if I want to send money to my mother-in-law in Europe, for example, um, today I'm going to use transfer wise because she's really not uh, crypto savvy and she's not really going to be able to navigate the exchanges and everything else. And so I'm going to send it some more traditional way, right? With the new system, um, you I'll be able to like, it, it actually won't matter what network she's using as long as it's connected. And I'll be able to send, you know, um, m money from my account through the the uh, back end that Nick's company is is uh, doing for the uh, next wallet that supports IDs and everything else for Z addresses. I, and and I'll be able to send her money through that wallet that she'll be able. She can use most phone apps, and it's actually the Thanks to uh, Max, who's not here. I don't think he's here. I'm it's here. Too late for him. Yeah, he is now. Oh, he is. Okay. Um, you know the and stuff that got, the stuff and, that. And also, Mike, you've got Nilesh hello uh, again from Venmo PayPal. So, okay. Yeah, he's uh, he's also going to have some interesting thoughts. On yeah. That. So the the stuff that the stuff that um, that he did on the whole card model is great because so you'll be able to send from your bank account that's connected to your app in like 145 countries through the network and convert, say, say you want to just come in through DAI, then you send it, you, you pay the 0.05%, you know, and it converts to either a Euro mapped or on the other side, then there's a fiat out, which actually is still can be supported, which, which effectively just does a normal conversion. If there's if there's die and that and the currency you're going to isn't available in any kind of stable coin on any network, then you know you probably use a more traditional market maker to get out to that currency. But the point is that your grandmother might want to use that. You know, my mother-in-law is probably going to want to use that, and um, I you know people don't even really in order to use that have to actually care that much about you know they might about Varus, about bitcoin about ethereum because if they're really just sending you know money but when bitcoin and ethereum and Varus, you know and and others and cardano and others become um more popular and more used like on really mass scale then she's going to be really familiar with using that app and it's just going to be another form of value that she can transfer or use. Got it. Got it. Um, can I ask uh, to zoom out a little bit here? Uh, when I first joined, this is Lyric in Chicago. Uh, when I first joined um, and I saw the title of the room and it said decentralized news, I have a media background. So I thought it was about decentralized news <laughs> at first, but now I get what you're talking about verifiable self-sovereign identities. And since I write about economics, I'm wondering, is this all about crypto? Is this all about uh, crypto-related economic in incentives? 
what's the, the relationship to DNS? What are the applications? Um, what is the connection between identity and privacy in your application? And, um, you know, we uh, had a doctor on in the speakers. I don't know if he's still there, but is this something, an application, could this be used for EHR, for electronic health records? Yeah. What yeah, are so, the legal and economic ramifications? What are the applications? So I know you're talking about fairly technical things, and I do believe no, I'm no, following no. you. I think that's a great question. These are the great questions. Connection? Yeah, so yeah. Um, I think I'll so, leave it at that. Well, but the, but the other thing I just want to say, I, I mean, I this is my first time uh, joining this room, and uh, and I think you know I'm the lead developer for the Varus community, and I think that one of the we're just talking about this part of of decentralized um, economics news and this blockchain now, and you know I'm not trying to take over the the room or something, but I think that's. That's why this discussion is is on this topic at this moment, and probably ID is going to be a recurring theme. But yes, to all of what you just said. In fact, there was an early. I think Nick mentioned the the group of people that we were talking to earlier on. So the wallet that supports IDs, basically, with this ID system. Um, let me try to let me let me try to describe it in a way where it doesn't really require. Uh, some of the background. So the ID system, it is self-sovereign. Uh, for people who are really into decentralizing crypto, you know, we were, we've just been talking about the um, revocable recoverable part of it. I do right. want to mention, I want to answer what you said, but I, I, I think it was um, uh, Iuliano who asked about uh, the next thing I was going to mention. I just want to quickly mention that and then just get to what you asked. So the, the thing that I was going to mention is this new capability that we call Varus Vault on the IDs. And what that is going to allow you to do, and you can try it out on testnet, is you basically, because Varus has a stake, staking, proof of stake, and proof of work. So you can stake your coins, people do, of course. And um, But if you can stake your coins, you're also today in a wallet where you can spend your coins. And although if you lose your private keys, you can recover, revoke and recover an ID. If someone steals your private keys, it might be that the time you find out that that happened is when there's a transaction already posted and confirmed on the blockchain and your money's gone. And so what Veris Vault allows you to do is time lock your ID. So what that means when you time lock an ID is that from the point you time lock it, you can set an unlock period. So it will be locked indefinitely when you time lock it. But when someone, even you, go to unlock it to use it for spending, then you must wait the amount of time you specified originally. Of course, you can revoke and recover. That's the other way. And so what that means is, uh, if you time lock an ID and someone unlocks it, then you know it wasn't you unless it was you and you can revoke and recover. So it's basically theft proof. I, I shouldn't say that, but I, that's kind of how I think about it. Um, the other thing you can do is if you, um, uh, before unlocking it, you have the primary identity, you can actually change the primary keys to fresh new keys that the blockchain has never seen before, unlock it, and you can be sure that it's not compromised. And so this new, just this new capability added to the existing self-sovereign ID model allows you to now, um, oh, and one more thing, when your ID is locked, all the funds that it controls can still stake just fine. So it can be used for trust because actually you could lock an ID for 21 years or you can lock an ID for some number of years. It can be revoked and recovered. It can be used for vesting schedules, these kinds of different things. But anyways, that was the other thing I wanted to mention. That's actually, you could try that out on testnet now. And now, now back to, um, could you use these for electronic health records and this? Okay. So uh, I'm going to just describe 
something that we have in the protocol that uh, I'm going to describe how it works conceptually. And, and I'm going to use a technical term, Merkle Mountain Range, but I'm not going to describe exactly how it works. I'm just going to describe the benefit you get from it. So a Merkle Mountain Range is a structure that has a list of things in it that each can, and then it has a root number, and you can make it grow by adding new things, and it changes the root number. But even if it grows, you can prove um, any individual element in it without disclosing any of the other elements in it. Okay. And so for an ID, like when we looked at, you know, COVID uh, certification, for example, or um, if you look at just general health information, we actually have defined in the, what we call the uh, various data exchange format, a model that again, someone correctly identified these IDs as a namespace um, where we define certain kinds of what we call claims and attestations that you can make relative to IDs. And those claims are like health claims and they can, and they follow the, there's like an international standard for health claims and you kind of like just follow that. And, and the general, the general way that it works is that uh, your entire health record can be represented so that each item in it can be disclosed and proven including signatures and everything else by a single root number that's associated provably with your ID, but it doesn't have to be publicly associated with. You. And this is actually the way that the entire network works kind of from at every level, there are Merkle mountain ranges actually at every level. And so what that means is that, you know, the idea with this ID is that once we roll out, the um, GUI for you know doing attestations and claims and, and valid there's already validation on the network you can already do signing and everything else but to make it you know people can make apps using it like just we're just putting it into the wallet but other people can make entire apps you can make a DocuSign using it. you know um, it's a protocol it's just a rent-free protocol out there right now that you know if somebody wants to even put it on their other blockchain we can explain how it works and they could they could figure out a way okay. to get it onto other So it's a, a Merkle yeah. mountain range is the opposite of a Merkle tree? It's not the opposite. It's a, the difference between the difference between a Merkle. It, yeah. No, well, yeah, kind of. The difference between a Merkle mountain range and a Merkle tree is that um, once you create a Merkle tree, then it is fixed. You can't add items to it. A Merkle mountain range is the same basic idea, but you can always add items to it and you can always kind of revert back to a previous state with a previous number and all the same items will be there. It's got a little bit of, um, it's a little more flexible in that way, um, but it's very, very similar to a Merkle tree. It's just a, uh, sorry, what? I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, Michael, is it like a version control system, right? You, you could think of it that, you could use it for that, yeah. I mean, you could use it for that, but it doesn't have to be a version control system. Like, um, you know, we do use it in places. So in a normal Bitcoin block, you have a Merkle tree, which is, I think, why the, why the question. And in the various uh, blocks, you have um, actually you have both a Merkle tree for compatibility and you have a Merkle mountain range, um, which allows us to do some things that other blockchains that I, I, I'm not aware of other blockchains that being able to do, for example, um, prove a part of a transaction, like just a specific output from a transaction rather than the whole transaction itself, which right now um, all the UTXO blockchains I'm aware of must prove the whole transaction, which can make things a lot more efficient when you're doing cross-chain aggregation and communication and protocols. But, but the, um, so the ID does allow you to actually um, hold and prove, you know, like so vaccine, certification, for example, you know, if you've got uh, COVID-19 data and you don't want to have to show any of your other medical data and there's, there are um, companies that either have, you know, like a hospital or a uh, health authority or uh, companies that could be recognized as having integrity to be able to certify that you have gotten a vaccine, for example, um, 
see that you have your vaccine records and we'll sign the root of that. You can put it all in the rest of all your health records, but when you want to show that you have a vaccine, you know, you could just show that and you don't have to show anything else. Um, in Bitcoin, the SPV, uh, the simplified payment verification exactly looks like you mentioned. Uh, well, no, and not, kind of, it does kind of. The difference is that you're right. I'm sorry. In, it, it proves it using a Merkle tree, but it proves the whole transaction and it proves you have to get the headers and you have to get the whole transaction. They don't have subatomic. I, I call them subatomic, sorry, but they don't, I, they don't have um, like sub transaction component proofs. Uh, they do, they did change um, some of the ways that you look up on some of the implementations of SPV, but they use a Merkle tree for the block, which is a, at the granularity of a transaction. And, you know, the reason that we needed to go to this new model is that for what we were trying to do, especially when you're going across blockchains, we want to have the most efficient packaging of the data. And there is a lot of data in a transaction that is useful for the same blockchain. But when you go to another blockchain, you know, you really don't need to have that. Does that make sense? I think Grin used Merkle Mountain Ranges. Right? Yeah, yeah. Grin, Grin did uh, use Merkle Mountain Ranges. And that was kind of like built into their product grid and um, uh, the other Mimble, Mimble Wimble, yeah. And, uh, and they used it for, and also it's interesting because we implemented a Merkle Mountain Range and started using it and then we've kind of extended and expanded its use quite broadly. And uh, Zcash also added a Merkle Mountain Range, I think, sometime after that. You know, the, 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 the structure itself can be used for a lot of different things. Mostly people are using it for similar things, which is to, you know, um, keep track of the whole blockchain. Um, because you have a Merkle mountain range doesn't mean that you're using it the same way that other projects might use it. Um, in the Verus network it's kind of interesting every single transaction actually has its own um mmr and it kind of is a fractal model that goes from there up to the entire uh blockchain which then allows the blockchain to be proven with just one you know similar you could i think you can do the same but i know you can do the same thing with like a grin or uh Mimble, and now with uh, Mimble Wimble or now with uh zcash and um, and you can do the same thing with Ethereum, but they have a different, they have Patricia trees, not, but the similar kind of purpose. Um, and so there are, it, it, anyways, it's a data structure that we use kind of in a fractal way throughout the system. And what it allows from an ID perspective is this is part of the Veris data exchange format, which basically allows you to define a Merkle mountain range and you can, and every ID, somebody mentioned name, every ID actually gets the ability to define their own namespace of names that might actually have meaning. So, you know, if um, some ISO standards body wants to define their own names, they, they can't, they just have an ID that's the root and then they define. And then when you want to refer to those elements of, you know, an attestation or a claim or a health record, then you just, there's an algorithm for taking any um, of the ID based names or names derived from IDs and turning that into an absolutely unique um, identifier that you can then use to create these kinds of records. So you can do, um, you can use these IDs for self sovereign, uh, you know, um, revocable, recoverable, uh, provable identities with any level of strength that can also be as like private enough and protect data enough to be used for um, GDPR compliant type things. Mike, I don't know how much more time you have, but like the whole identity thing, as crazy as it is, it, it it's really only one of 
uh, well, three things that I am aware of that make this project just so freaking crazy, um, especially from a like perspective of where most of us are coming from. The other Thank two are, well, the, the, yeah, the other two are what you were touching on earlier, which is kind of, I, I, I don't even know what to call it, like native token wrapping, where you can have oh. arbitrary external assets pass back and forth. Yeah, so that's the, actually, yeah, I, I'm a, I, I like that subject. Actually. Yeah. Well, let, let, me, let me just name the other one before, yeah. just so we can budget your time here. The, the third one is what you touched on with uh, with the merge mining, where uh, it seems like you're basically doing what the Digibyte guys are doing, where you're creating like an, an AMM for external hash rates that oh. you're using. And I don't even know what what you're doing with this or, or why why you went with went with that. Oh, so okay. So other, yeah. So all yeah. right. So the, all right. Let me. So let me just kind of cover those at a high level first. So. All right, I'm going to start backwards and start with merge mining, even though I also like the other subject a lot, because it's really important to understand if you're going to have a network of blockchains, do you really want, like, okay, so one solution to this problem of, you know, thermodynamically using up all the power to, you know, process transactions on blockchain networks, um, you know, there's an argument that that will happen. Like you'll just eventually just, you know, use up more and more and more power if you're doing everything proof of work. But what we decided to do was say, well, okay, proof of work has a different property, which is it's, it allows people who do not yet have free capital to participate with other resources and to become part of the economy, you know? And if you actually create a system that is not, um, susceptible to 51% hash attacks, then you, then you have an economic incentive to be part of it through mining. But I don't believe like it, it doesn't exceed if, if you're 50% proof of stake, it creates kind of a balance that won't be exceeded by the cost of, of the mining side of it. Okay, and so, okay, so your base layer consensus is only kind of a two method AMM of Proof of no, no, no. So, so no, not yet. I didn't. This is the single blockchain model. Okay. So, so Varus has fifty percent proof of stake, fifty percent proof of work. But now, when you think about, all right, you're going to have a network of chains. Those chains, they need to be able. You well, it's a lot more valuable if they can send across chains as easily as they can send on chain. You just have to wait a tiny bit longer, right? It's a lot more valuable, okay? Um, and and uh, if sorry, just one second, I got interrupted for a second. Um, and if you if you send across chains, you need to be able to prove that to one chain, like because when you're validating transactions, you don't get to make calls out. It's just you're at a low level. You don't get to do that. And so um, you need to, the information that allows you to cryptographically prove that what you are going to do is correct. And in order to do that from a cross chain transaction, you need to be able to prove that the transaction you're processing really came from the other chain. And it has to be in some kind of a format that you can understand, some kind of a protocol that you can understand. And so in order to prove that, you're going to need people. It doesn't have to be everybody, but it's going to be some people who will have incentive to validate those relationships, or you're going to need some way of cryptographically proving that the other chain is the chain it says it is. And in order to do that, you're still going to need people to run things to make that happen. Okay? So let's say you're, let's say you're valid. So you're so, so this is where merge mining comes in. Because by merge mining, if I'm going to run two different blockchains or three different blockchains for any reason, and I got my computer mining by running hash, why should I have to uh, run different hashes on my computer for different blockchains? So what we've done is we basically created this, it's a dynamic merge mining system 
So if I'm running multiple by merge mine, I actually get the ability to help uh, tie those two chains together cryptographically. Okay. And not only that, I get the ability to maximize the use of my hash power. And to, you know, maybe I can even support like internal corporate chains and then some external chains and it's almost free for the internal uh, systems to run actually. And, and so what I end up being able to do is when I load a new node, it recognizes the, that's part of the, the daemon. It recognizes that, you know, it's got another chain running. And if the other chain's mining, they'll basically merge in the protocol. They'll merge data in the headers and they'll just automatically merge mine. And if you close a, a daemon, then that one will be out of your merge mining list. And, you know, you can merge mine a lot together. But it's the combination, like merge mining gives you a little more credibility to help prove a chain cryptographically. And staking, interestingly enough, gives you more, a little more credibility to be able to prove a chain as well. And we have this kind of a cross-chain cryptographic proof model based uh, on similar concepts to the fly client model, which we built in. They also use a Merkle Mountain range, but they didn't have a way to solve it relative to proof of stake. And, um, and although we have a model for proving uh, cross chain cryptographically, the first release of this technology is going to include um, notarization, cross chain groups of notaries that will just simply have the job of saying, yep, that really is that chain. That's about it. That's all they really have to do. That's their only job. So like, I, I just, I don't understand how you could validate, let's say the Bitcoin blockchain on your chain. Would, would you then have like something like oracles whose job it is to propose new Bitcoin oh. blocks into your chain? And then you're essentially running a whole other Nakamoto consensus on your chain in a certain way you could say something like, but right so right now we are actually notarized um komodo notarized for example into the bitcoin blockchain and so we can actually already um provide proof for bitcoin the bitcoin blockchain the problem with the bitcoin blockchain is that it doesn't have any uh programmable way of controlling and releasing funds and that has to be done with multi-sig only effectively and so there isn't really a way to leverage proving of the Bitcoin blockchain into a seamless cross-chain bridge, which is why you have projects like RenVM, you know. Well, yeah, and one of the projects that I follow is or Rap, um, yeah, is uh, CKB, Nervo CKB. Yeah. And th are you aware of that project? I've heard of it, but I don't know much about it. No. They're they're going for something similar where it's they're they're kind of going. Uh, to going at the interoperability uh, play, but going from it from the bottom, not from the top, where they're they're like we're at the interoperability layer one, and they they made some interesting decisions, like their VM is risk five, so you know basically it, it's yeah, but of, I, yeah. So 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 what their idea was is that kind of um, you can just developers could just compile in sort of their own little bridges. Um, yeah, I mean you, you, don't you know. Mean? It, so, well, so I know what you mean, but you know, the thing, so here's the thing, um, that would be, so there's a certain level, like when we're bridging to Ethereum, we use the same protocol and we use APIs that we use when we're bridging to another PBAS chain or that we would use bridging, but Ethereum has a different, um, they use Patricia trees, not Merkle mountain ranges, right? So for Ethereum and every Ethereum clone, then we would support Patricia tree proof in our code. Okay. Now I could see something like what you're talking about being used, but I'm, you know, the protocol is actually always like, we already have a protocol that is JSON API based that, you know, you could reach a lot of systems with it and you can reach centralized systems with it. So you could have a wrapped Bitcoin quite easily, you know, doing a bridge and you could have a company decide that they're going to, um, they're going to have an internal system, centralized system, and they're going to represent all of the bi-directional currencies on that system on the blockchain. You know, they could do that with this protocol. Um, 
But the one thing that you might gain if you were to have, because we don't have a VM right now. And the one thing you might gain if you were to have a VM uh, in this regard could be that you might be able to write, you know, a new uh, hash proof into, but I, you could just make an upgrade anyways with the amount of work that would take to do. I don't know that that would be so hard. And, and typically these things like, you know, we're open source. So if somebody really needed to do something like that and we'd work with them to do that. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, like, I don't think of that as being the way that we're going to do bridging because I think that the real challenge in bridging is how are you going to have a protocol to like, all right, I'm going to send a transaction over to Ethereum, right? Uh, that's giant. Just that, just to do that. I don't care if I know exactly what the Ethereum, you know, state route is and I can trust everything and I don't need any notarization across chain. Um, cause I just magically have all that information to be able to cryptographically prove a transaction from Verus to Ethereum or from Ethereum to Verus or from any chain to any chain of any size is a giant transaction compared to transactions. So for anybody to be successful making a cross chain cross system protocol, they better have aggregation of everything built into the core. And that has to be just part of the protocol. You know, there has to be like big, thick pipes of aggregation going between the systems so that people don't have to think about it and they don't have to pay so much for the, for those things to be transferred. And so the protocol that we have as more of like, a, you know, there's a, there's a notarization process between systems that can be based on notaries that can be based on cryptographic proof. It's, it's an abstract concept and right now it's going to include notarizations, but it's all about just proving that that is the state. It's like an Oracle for the state route. Uh, and that's it. There's not an Oracle for anything else. Once you know that you can believe that that is the right chain, then you can, in every case, you can prove every transaction on that blockchain that's behind that point. Right. And when you say you know that that's the right chain, essentially what you would be doing is you say, that they're, they're, again, kind of what I was saying before, you're, you're basically looking at a parallelized version of whatever that other chain's uh, you know, block security model is on. No, 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 you're not. No, you're not. Because what you can just, it doesn't matter what they use to secure their blockchain. What matters is if their blockchain is correct or not. And what is the hash algorithm and the tree, Merkel Mountain Range or Patricia Tree or Merkel of Merkels, which, you know, some use. And that's all kind of similar. So it's not like that different or hard. And, and it matters what's the algorithm to prove. And do you believe that that's the right chain? That's it. It doesn't, you don't have to know their algorithm for security. You don't have to know any of that stuff because if you can know that that is the state route for that chain, then you can cryptographically prove every single transaction behind it. Is this a, a trusted um, uh, network? No, the, the, it's a, it can do centralized or decentralized. So the, here's how it works. The way that we did the original um, PBAS test network, this was before we released IDs, before we had IDs, and it was, uh, I guess, a little over a year and a half ago now. Um, and that actually included uh, DeFi, but it didn't have IDs. And that's what I meant when I said we had to change things around and it disturbed me. Um, the, the model was using this cross-chain cryptographic proof. So it's like this. I'm just going to give you a general concept, not the exact algorithm. So it's like this. So if I'm staking, then on the Verus network, I prove that I am the old, that I am, I have control of a transaction that has been on the blockchain for 150 blocks, which is like 150 minutes, and that I am 
spending that for the purpose of staking this block, which because of the algorithm, I can prove that I beat other people who might have been trying to compete for that. Okay, so I had money on the chain. I control money on the chain. There's some level of interest. And when I do that, and this was actually something that also prompted us to do this subatomic proof, I actually take, and there was a, there was a, you probably might not be aware of this, but there was a proof of stake attack that was going around like a little over, I guess it was about a year and a half ago, where they basically um, were putting in fake stake headers that would make nodes think that it was a real stake header, but it wasn't because it actually didn't refer to a valid transaction. And so we literally in the header include the subatomic proof of your stake output. That means that that header proves part of the chain 150 blocks back naturally. That means a proof of stake header is hard to get and it includes proof of something 150 blocks back on the chain that nobody can fake. And so when you get a proof of stake block, then you now have the ability to provide some valid, some valid proof to the other chain that they can then compose that. You should look at the fly client paper. They can take that and they can compose that. So basically when you, you say, all right, here is the root of the other chain. I'm going to take a stab and I know it is right. And I'm going to put this correct root and I'm going to have a um, little bit of validation that this is the right root of this chain. Now, nobody's going to, this is the model that doesn't require notaries. Nobody's going to believe me at first because I could just be lying and it might not be the right route. Then other people come along and they say, yep, that is the right route. And then they, may add, they add another one. This is how the notarization works. And, and they say, yep, that was the right route. I, I refer to that one. That's correct. And they prove something that the blockchain generated random number tells them to prove about the past of the other chain, which must be exactly consistent with everything else. And statistically, if you do this like 10 times, you really just can't lie because you're, you're just not going to be able statistically to actually do that with, you know, reasonably at all. And so it's a way of proving in a hundred percent decentralized way, permissionless way, um, blockchain to blockchain. But because, um, we do not feel that like we had that, we have that. Um, but there's so much right now in this technology that, you know, we're not going to say that that's the thing we're going to make everything bet on that, that algorithm and that, that proving is, is done. We're going to do these other things first and we're going to have the ability to notarize and we're going to have, you know, some number of, some reasonable number of notaries that will be able to earn by basically, and everybody who defines a different chain will be able to have their notaries that will be able to basically um, prove to the blockchain through their notarizations, you know, N of M of N that um, they agree, but the miners and stakers will actually propose the uh blocks as they earn so there's this concept of earning um a note the right to notarize and they will get incentive for that too and so it is a decentralized protocol but we will be putting uh you know it's still decentralized like if you talk to a lot of different groups they would say that's decentralized lawyers will say that's decentralized because they did um you know it isn't a hundred percent the first backup notary piece is um you know some number of notaries they're not going to be super high paid and their job is going to be to basically uh validate that those are the correct chains so is part of what you're doing with the merge mining thing and i'm sorry if you already tried to explain this is, is you're trying to incentivize say I'm, I'm a bitcoin miner and i find a block so i i'm about to propose 
the new highest block. If I'm merge mining on yours, it somehow creates uh, an incentive for me to propose not only directly to the Bitcoin network, but directly to to the Verus network as well. Well, that's merge mining, but we don't merge mine with Bitcoin. So what we do, every merge mine, every PBAS chain can merge mine. And so people can create PBAS chains. These are independent chains. They, you know, there's like a launch uh, cost that goes to miners and stakers, but there's no one taking rent. And once they create their chain, basically they're going to live or die based on if people are interested in their project or their chain or the purpose of it. Okay. And Stop they'll have ID. DeFi, they'll have IDs, they'll have all these things. But they'll also have the ability to be one of the chains that people who are mining Varus or pools that are mining Varus could choose to add to the chains that they're going to mine. So the hash power that people use get to be, gets to be used across multiple projects and projects get to leverage the hash power across the entire Varus network. That, that's that's wonderful. Uh, I always wondered why the Digibyte guys weren't doing something like that. Do you know if, if there's something technical in the way that they're doing their, they call it multi-algo, that yeah. why aren't they doing, like, it seems well, so obvious to me that that's what you want to do if you're I, going down that route. Yeah, so I haven't seen anyone doing it the way that we're doing it. Um, and so I can't say why they're not. I just haven't seen. So what we're doing is, we actually have a dynamic. So, so we started from a Zcash um, header, if you might or might not know. Um, and, and basically, the Zcash header is an Equihash a hash algorithm. And we went to a CPU mineable algorithm that we really tuned to be able to compete. So basically, CPUs blow away GPUs with our mining algorithm. Um, you can mine with either one but you'll get much more efficient and faster mining with, with good CPUs than you will with GPUs. Why that and instead of random X? Why, why did you go through all that work? Because I actually don't think that random X solves the problem at all. What we did is we had a different approach and actually we did it. I think when we did it, there wasn't even random X wasn't popular at all. It was just like starting out. And I actually talked to, um, uh, who was that woman who did, I met with that woman who did, um, the ETH POW, what was that alternative ETH POW? What was that? Kapow? K no. No, she did a new ETH algorithm that was going to be like the new ETH POW for some time. And there was, there was some big debate over it. But anyways, bottom line is I looked at what was available and we really, I, there was just nothing that could really, in my mind, do this. And the goal was to, um, you know, because I, I mean, I've been kind of an assembly language programmer for years. And, and so the goal was to basically um, leverage the ASIC. So, so keep it a quantum secure algorithm. So it has a quantum secure uh, step, but, or quantum resistant, you know, like quantum resistant. But the, uh, to basically leverage the ASICs that, already exist in modern CPUs by using the most integrated cryptographic instructions in a way that is in a loop that FPGAs just really just have a hell of a time with. And so they can, they can do it, you know, and GPUs can do it. But the problem is they don't have all the specialized ASIC hardware. And, and really, you know, so it's like CPUs are kind of like big ASICs, but they're ASICs to be CPUs. And so this was kind of a way of turning things around so that the CPU ASIC works for the Varus hash. And, you know, and if you wanted to try and do that with an FPGA, like right now, a good FPGA algorithm, as I understand it. Um, so one of the companies doing FPGA uh, algorithms, they just stopped. And I think the reason is they were never, they weren't competitive with what some other people were telling us they were able to get with FPGAs. And I think that they just, they didn't want to be like same level of speed as a CPU and sell an FPGA. And so, um, but I do, I do believe numbers that I've gotten that, um, 
you know, a really large FPGA is going to get about 1.6 times, you know, maybe like one, one point two times the cost ROI and 1.6 times the energy ROI over CPU. And we're, we're actually pretty comfortable with that. And so going to random X is like, okay, now we jump into GPUs again, where we really, you know, really wanted people to be able to like everyone, the kind of the original Bitcoin philosophy was, you know, if you've got a CPU, you should be able to do, we have people mining with arms and for the network, you know, arm 64 CPUs and for the network, you know, um, I think it's healthiest when we have as much decentralization as possible, which this really drives. So, so I ha go, go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to ask you, so you, you, you believe that this hash function you created, and I forgot this was, this is a fourth thing that's, that's crazy about this project. You believe this hash function you created is the, um, the, I don't know how to describe it, but you don't know what I mean? The best CPU algorithm, the most, um, purposefully basic GPU FPGA resistant hash algorithm out there. Um, I'll, I'll rephrase in it. Yes. In, but you got to take ASIC off of that because when somebody makes an ASIC for this, then, um, we're going to probably need to redo the algorithm because ASICs and FPGAs, people might think of them as the same, but they're really not. And, you know, if you, if you really invest on making a full blown ASIC for this algorithm, then the balance that we've achieved with CPUs and FPGAs will, you, you, it's really going to tilt towards the ASIC. And honestly, um, I know that we can make this, uh, I know that we could make FPGAs weaker than CPUs with it. I'm confident that we can. Because I, we have, you know, it's, we kind of designed a way of, of doing this. When it comes to ASICs, I actually don't know. Um, when we get to real ASICs for the network, uh, then hopefully we're just going to get, we're either going to be able to make CPUs competitive with them again, which is quite possible, but not a guarantee. Or we're going to work to try and make sure that we can get, you know, inexpensive mass market ASICs that anyone could choose to get. Right. So there's a, just a couple thoughts I have on that. So one is is the the Nervo CKB guys. They designed their um, their hash function Eagle Song. I don't know if you heard of it. Just no, Eagle Song. Eagle Song is in, Eagle Song. Is in the, the bird. Yeah, look it up. Um, they designed their hash function to make ASICs. ASIC development as cheap and kind of as egalitarian as possible. So that's that's one kind of way I've seen people develop. The other the other thing I've seen is I I can't remember, I can't remember what the project is, but they um they basically have a way in their in their hash algorithm of kind of like it, it's like they change it every two years or, so, or every year or something. And yeah, the way I, in which they. Or there are those yeah, mutating I mean, algorithms too. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but basically, basically they just have like, okay, every year we do a hard fork, and the algorithm changes just enough that any ASIC was made for it is now useless. But the, but the thing is, we could do that any time. I mean, the way that our algorithm is set up, it's got you know, it's got the uh, the kind of secure quantum secure part, and then it's got the part that forces everybody to follow the algorithm. You know. And they're separated and uh <clears throat> and so the part that forces everybody to follow the algorithm um that could be changed pretty much at any time and so the problem with asics is until we have an asic and we have an asic designer make an asic for it then we actually don't know um FPGAs were kind of similar, except that what I did is I went through and I looked at all the specs of all the available FPGAs and I looked at what they were strong you know, on and what they were weak on. And I looked at CPUs and I kind of designed it to really make sure that, that it stressed the things that FPGAs had limited resources or expensive resources for. 
Um, on A6, you know, just it's just going to be a different animal because when we did FPGAs, the first algorithm for FPGAs, it worked as expected. Then we had some really good FPGA developers working on it, and they kind of showed that it was going to, it wasn't going to be quite as strong as we wanted, but, you know, you could argue it was strong enough. Um, but then one of the guys in the community, uh, actually Chris, I don't know if he's still on, um, he figured out a way to uh, pre, like basically not defeat the hash exactly, but to leverage a way through statistical analysis of different things, to leverage a way to kind of focus on one area more than others, so that you could up your hash algorithm speed by a little bit of a trick, you know? And we didn't want any tricks in the algorithm. We actually didn't leverage it. To his credit, he didn't leverage it at all. We didn't even announce it. This is probably the first time it's publicly been talked about. And we just removed it. And we also then took that opportunity to uh, slightly more equalize the, um, the FPGA and uh, CPU hash rates. And so, you know, like we don't have any plans to change the algorithm because we don't really have a need to. And when ASICs come out at some point, because that's a pretty big investment, um, we could change it and frustrate them. Or we could, you know, like change it and... Uh, and maybe bring CPUs to their level, depending on what they are. That might be really hard, might not be a reasonable goal. Um, you know, I don't believe that we're going to just change the world and make everybody get an ASIC tomorrow. And I'd rather right now leverage the fact that until somebody invests in ASICs for this, um, it's, a, it's a great algorithm for all of the hardware that is available or that we are aware is available and you know as soon as there it looks like there's an ASIC then we're you know we've got a number of things that we can um, work to do I, that's amazing I I think I was telling Nicholas this last night I, I the most astonishing thing about this project I think is that no one really has heard of it yet <laughs> we, we're too busy <laughs> building stuff. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's really true. A lot of a lot of people are just working on stuff. Well, Nicol Nicholas and those who was in the room last night, Nicholas was, was trying to get through and and explain us all these things and like everything he's saying. He's like, oh yeah, we just like solved the identity problem and it's revocable and recoverable. Oh yeah, it's just a universal dex and it has like you can just send that. <laughs> on it. Oh yeah, we just created like this automatic market maker of hash rate that everything can go into. Um, and I, I was at the point where, uh, where I said, it just didn't I, seem reasonable. I, I, I was at the point where I was, I thought, I think it's more likely that Nicholas is actually an AI <laughs> sent to indoctrinate us into some like, cult. <laughs> then this funny. project exists and I've never heard of it. <laughs> so you actually, so you were asking about, uh, we talked about the hash rate, um, the merge mining and then now the the defi or the multi currency how does that work right yes like how does your interoperability thing do okay so is it the interoperability or is it the all right so there it's each piece is relatively simple on its own that's the thing about it is that it isn't that the project is trying to do everything, it's that all these pieces are part of the right platform. It's like, you know, they need to be there. And so when you say, if I send a transaction from Ethereum to Verus, now, yes, it's gonna be aggregated. Yes, it might come over in a bundle of 50 or 100 with one proof amortized across all of them. So that's more efficient and everything else. But if I send a transaction from Ethereum to Verus, then all the wallets in Ethereum and, and, you know, kind of the easiest way to do that is I'm going to pay the fee in Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, you know, this is a fundamental problem actually, because you're going to pay the fee in Ethereum, 
but it's going to Varus, and Varus only knows how to accept fees in Varus. And Ethereum only knows how to accept fees in Ethereum. And unless you put a person in the middle who's going to provide a service and then they're going to extract rent, there's no real solution for that right now in today's crypto. So what we do is instead we say, all right, all right, let's just park that for a minute. So now we can prove cross chains and, and let's talk about DeFi, Varus DeFi. Well, what is the DeFi system? It's, it's actually a, a fractional reserve currency system at the protocol level. So rather than saying, well, you're gonna code a contract to make a currency, we say, well, the, the blockchain protocol recognizes the existence of other currencies, okay? So because it recognizes the existence of other currencies, um, you might also ask the question, well, could it, could it convert currencies you know, could you plug DeFi right into the system? And well, so obviously the answer is yes. And the way that it works is that you're kind of like exporting and importing from the Varus chain into a currency or from the Varus chain to another chain or from another chain to the Varus chain, okay? And when a transaction comes in from Ethereum, it doesn't, so every bridge or PBAS connection can have a converter currency, which is effectively a basket currency, which holds the currencies on both sides. And so when I send a transaction from Ethereum to Varus, it lands in that converter currency's imports. And so it takes the fee in Ethereum and it converts it to Varus and it pays out the fee in Varus and it charges the same 0.05% on that fee so that it's just a little extra uh, yield for the people holding that bridge currency, you know, but it also converts DAI, it will. And so, but it's not just about Ethereum and Varus, you can do that on every bridge. And so because DeFi is built into the protocol, you can send from one system to another. And if the system that you're sending to or from doesn't support DeFi, then you put the DeFi bridge on the Varus or the other PBAS chain side. And in a model, like here's another, here's an example that's kind of interesting. So after, this is kind of the chicken and egg problem of how do you really handle a fully automated um, communication across blockchains where you've got to pay fees? And this is the way. And so if you, um, once this, you know, we, we figured this out, then you look at like a, a PBAS chain and you say, you know, when I launch a PBAS chain, because we were originally, our original um, DeFi actually allows you to have the native currency of a PBAS chain as a DeFi currency. So you could literally have mining and staking and conversion to and from the same native coin on the blockchain that worked on the test net a year and a half ago and you know we analyzed everything and kind of came to the conclusion that that's not good that's not right because um it reduces the security that you get from proof of stake because the currency the native currency that secures and protects that blockchain is not limited and i believe it actually should be and so now we say, all right, well, when you launch a PBAS chain, well, all the PBAS chains can have DeFi on them as well. It's just built in. So it's just part of the protocol. And, you know, you don't want to, like, it's our goal is not to be rent seeking for everybody. And, you know, so if somebody launches a currency, then they launch the currency. That, that means that they probably don't warrant having a whole blockchain to themselves or, or being the root of another entire ecosystem of blockchains. So they probably don't need a blockchain and they can always do one later. But if somebody wants to make a blockchain for what they're doing, they launch, most likely they're going to launch two currencies at the same time. And it's really easy because it's just a command, part of the API. So they just launch, but it'll have a cost and you wouldn't want to just do it trivially. So they'll launch a blockchain and then they'll launch the converter currency at the same time 
and it will run on the other blockchain. And you may say, oh, but then various owners don't, you know, holders don't make money from staking and mining when you do conversion sending to and from that blockchain. But it's actually okay because it doesn't matter. It's an independent blockchain and the people who started that blockchain actually get to kind of have a little bootstrap of a DeFi converter currency for their blockchain that can actually be tailored the way that they want it to be. And the pre-mine of any blockchain actually literally doesn't have to be given to anyone. The pre-mine can go into the converter currency and nowhere else if you want. It, it, you could have a pre-mine that goes to people, goes to a company, maybe someone you know selling some thing to that blockchain currency. You could, just like you, you can with a, with a um, fractional token, but um, you can actually make it so that the pre-mine goes into the converter currency. So anybody who buys into the converter currency pre-launch and when I say buy in, I just mean that they post a transaction on the blockchain. There's nobody selling them currency. They participate by posting a transaction, which ends up meaning that they end up being holders when that, when that currency goes live, assuming it met the minimum going live requirements and doesn't give refunds to everybody instead. And so when that currency goes live now, all the holders who participated can be holding this bridge currency so they're going to make a they're going to make a yield when any whenever anybody sends back and forth or when anyone uses it on that chain to convert between currencies and if they want to stake on the other chain they would sell their bridge currency to the native currency of that chain and begin staking now if you think about the economics of that what that means is Nowhere in that whole model does it mean anyone should lose because the people who got in sell or something because you don't get in unless you might want some of that currency. And when you sell that to that currency, it actually makes like it, it has a positive effect on the value of all the currencies involved, except for the, you know, currencies you use to buy in. So what you're saying is, Ferris is going to be the genesis block for every VC coin from here on out. You know, I think the smart yes. ones might start looking at it. Yeah, it could launch kind of launch because then you, you make thing. it that way and then you send it over to Ethereum if you want to use the Ethereum VM, no problem. But you can also just send it around on Ver. So you make your own chain and you don't have any fee congestion and you print your own IDs for your own, you know, access to whatever it is you're doing. I mean but the whole network just grows. Unbelievable, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's the, those were the covering the different questions you had, right? Uh, yes. And uh, I think that the best thing for me is going to go back and really dig into the UTXO model. I, you, you've given me kind of a, mid to high level view of the thing but i really really want to try to figure out precisely on a technical level what it is you guys are doing that is that is different um i, I get this it's just if i just the fact that you guys kind of find it surprising how odd and different and alien this whole thing is to the to the rest of us it just tells me that you guys have just been like working in your own little hole and you're like this like parallel offshoot of this whole thing that hasn't like touched back into where everyone else has been going for a very long time that and you that and you pronounce it defi instead of defi it just tells me it, i believe you, <laughs> you tell me that you've just been busy this whole time and that's the reason why no one has heard about it well you know you know before there was DeFi or DeFi, um, before there was, it was really a thing. We already, so we already had it on the network. We already had fractional reserve currencies over a year and a half ago on the network. And it really was this concept of, you know, we wanted to bring 
all we wanted to make a system that would bring all other currencies into the fold and enable us to represent all of these other systems and currencies. And the only real way to do that actually was with IDs. And so the process of trying to figure out the absolute minimum ID technology required to provide the claims, the attestations, and the revocable and recoverable pieces. And I think that's actually what we came up with. Um, once we came up with that, we actually just couldn't, we, we had to stop and make the IDs first because everything else needs them. Right. Because yeah, because when, when you're dealing with all these other different, very different security models, right? You, you want an undo button basically. Every, well, it's, it's not just the, it's not about the undo button actually. It's, it's also just like, okay, so somebody makes a currency. How do I know that that currency is even made by that group? Like, or, or that company or that person, how do I even know that? You know, well, the currencies are tied directly to IDs, which are provable. That was critical. And once you're going to go that far, then you need to at least take a look at everything. And I, you know, and I had spent enough time working on it. Like I did, we did a single sign on ID system for the, the parallels application provisioning system. I worked, you know, I did kind of early, um, Bill Gates think week papers on identity back before there was, you know, even Microsoft passport trying to get them to look at, at this concept. And I, and I've done, you know, I did a social network that Microsoft ended up buying later after I left and then they bought it and then did an ID system for that. And, you know, as much as anyone, I actually was not really wanting to tackle IDs first because I knew how hard of a problem it was. But once we came up with this solution, it's just, it's just, it's right. That's the thing about it. It's like, it was right. And so, uh, we didn't need to wait any longer and it wasn't, it wasn't so complex. Like I've, I've talked to people who don't know crypto and when they tell me about, you know, like this, this woman, um, told me that you know her mother lost all of her bitcoin because she lost her private keys and, and and i explained ids to her and she just you know absolutely understood and loved the reason why she would want them but it doesn't address all the other reasons why you might want them you know right um do, do you guys have a proof of uniqueness system i don't think we got into that you mean a unique human? You mean we have a proof of yes. like, uh, no, it, it's a, it can. So we've talked about this and I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about this and we can, we have a way of using, it's effectively similar to big data models where you're, you can use at, uh, attestations that include attestations of, um, you know, I would not attest multiple times for the same person this you know this particular entity office company authority i would not attest multiple like a kyc type of thing right we don't have any final protocol that we have defined although we have every tool you would need to do what you're saying so everything from this decentralized uh, distributed attestations to strengthen identities um, to provable and also uh, selectively private information that can be attested to. Um, you can use that to construct what you're talking about, but that's in and of itself to get to a provable level of what you're saying is, you know, using these tools or, or any other similar tools and you know providing kind of a i would say it's probably going to end up being a statistical proof of uniqueness similar to the proof of um the strongest kind of an oracle you know what i mean yeah um i have that that particular problem proof of uniqueness like when i, I kind of thought that i was thinking about identity this whole time but i think now that i've been talking to you i realize problem that I've really been thinking about for a long time is the proof of uniqueness problem. 
And I don't know another, I don't know a way to do it without like some kind of semi centralized Oracle. Um, well, because you can, because you can have like, um, you can have, so think of the way that we do things today. And it's really similar. Like I can't say what, I, I don't know what country you're in. You don't have to tell me. It doesn't, like, that's not the point. But but I can't say what authorities you would trust to determine, you know, what ID is valid. Um, we could say that we might trust passports, but, you know, passports can be forged. We can, there's literally not a single piece of ID that any single person could prove about another person. But when we have, you know, reasons to prove our identity, we say, well, you're going to need two forms of ID and you're going to need blah, blah, blah. And you're going to need a letter from, you know, the power company and blah, blah, blah. And and it's really kind of like you end up doing the same kind of thing, but you do it digitally where you say there are many different authorities that will have identities worldwide that you might put a certain amount of credence in their attestation. And when you have a preponderance of attestations, or a certain cross section or certain intersection of attestations, you might be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that you trust that. But it doesn't require any single central entity to be an Uber authority for any of it. Right. Um, the, the thing, the thing about the proof of uniqueness problem is it, 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 it's, it's like a problem that the, the current tools of incentive design that crypto has given us don't work on because because crypto is all about money and, and money is a reward and the currently our systems kind of um uh, are all about uh giving a reward for doing actions and and kind of the, the worst thing you can do is you can kind of slash a stake so 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 pretty much every system you would do it always incentivizes a civil that's actually not so i don't know this whole thing about slashing stakes i'm not convinced so we do proof of stake and we have a solution to the nothing at stake problem you know and we didn't do it through slashing stakes um in fact we don't even force you to lock up your funds to stake if you have your funds in your wallet they're just going to stake for you if you turn on staking because it's just all unnecessary. Because the key is, do you really have those funds? Are they really under your control? You know, if, if they're sitting there for 150 blocks and you can prove by spending them in, a, in your block that you have them, then yeah, they're under your control. You know, they've, they've settled for 150 blocks. There's not a reorg gonna come that's gonna change anything. They're yours, you're proving it. You have a right to use them to stake. Now, if you, the nothing at stake problem as an example is that I've got two different blockchains coming in. I'm going to stake on both of them because what do I have to lose, right? I'm going to stake on both of them. And I don't even care if one of them looks more likely to win or more correct to me because the more I stake on, the more chance I'm going to have of winning that stake. That's the nothing at stake problem, right? Well, what we do is the way that the stake transaction is set up, um, you commit to the chain you're staking on and if anyone can find any transaction and the, and the demons look for them, they, we call it cheat catcher. And if anyone can find any transaction or state guard, actually, so the, the marketing people decided to call it state guard because cheat catcher sounded not as nice. Um, but, but basically, if anyone finds a transaction signed by the same person who wins a stake, but not with the same stake and everything else, but not the same chain, they get to use it to spend that person's winnings to themselves. Aha. Uh -huh. And so you don't need slashing because there's no incentive to do that because you're going to be caught. Well, isn't that right there? That, 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 that's if you can say it's a form of slashing, but you cheated and the only thing you lose is your ill-gotten gains, nothing else. Right. You don't but put any of your principal at risk. I mean slashing principle. We don't slash principle. Okay, okay, but hold on. That construction that you just described to me, can't that be used to help to, to solve the proof of uniqueness problem somehow? Well, that same concept will be used to solve it. But the, the, the only reason that I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not taking the, 
opportunity to describe how we would solve proof of uniqueness is as people who know me will tell you, you know, I don't have the final, I, I have tools that I know can solve it. And I don't have the final, like I, unless I could describe, you know, what level of evidence, like I could imagine having part of an attestation is the assurance from the attesting entity that they would never attest that user twice and some kind of an ID that nobody knows or a unique hash ID that nobody knows. You know what I mean? Right. Yep. Yep. And, and then the ability to provide a unique copy of that hash um, to someone who wanted to know if you were unique and they could look and see, do you have any of these different attesters who have claimed that you are, you, you know, that they would never attest someone else as the same. And I'm going to, I'm going to require at least some kind of intersection of these different attesters or some kind of common ID used between them. But that's a privacy question. You know what I'm saying? There's like this tension on this particular kind of a proof between proving it and privacy and it can be done, but it's really, that's the tension. Cause I mean, right. if you were willing to give out your passport ID to everybody and you could attest that then you, that's good enough. Like it gets what people use today, you know, but I don't think you want to do that. I don't think. No, you don't. Yeah. So I think, you know, to get a really, uh, anonymous or pseudonymous proof of uniqueness is the challenge. And I think that, you know, you kind of have to, it's like when I looked at, um, um, you know, networking algorithms for, uh, for ensuring, uh, security of nodes. You know, the uh, only, like, the research kind of points to the idea that you can secure a network of nodes, like you can know which nodes are the ones you can trust, but you generally have to build the trust from some starting point of trust. I'm actually not sure that that's true, and, and that was kind of the whole model of, you know, Varus virtue and this kind of thing. Well, there are projects um, that do that, that have an identity system right. that, that has to kind of do that, you know, I, I know, friend type I know, thing. I know, I know. But even that is like, you you know, it started with this, th that's kind of the point, the eigenvalue plus plus um, uh, network node uh, security protocol. Their research basically came to the conclusion that they always have to start with some network that they can at least consider more trusted than average, you know? And I still don't know. I think you can actually start with provable things that people can lie. They could give you give participants an opportunity to lie. This is kind of the proving change. You give them an opportunity to lie about things, but you make sure that the protocol will not succumb to it. And then they build up their reputation because they had an opportunity to think that they could cheat. You know what I mean? That's really interesting. How do you do that? Sustainable. Uh, yeah, I have ideas. <laughs> we don't do that yet. <laughs> but you know, I you think a lot of times, I think know? actually the interesting, the interesting thing is I, so, you know, I think, and I'll just say it this way, that you can create systems that could expose bad behavior, but not necessarily catch it at first and not be, and not succumb to it. And then maybe retroactively actually use it as well as good behavior to help establish a smaller network of more than average trust. That's literally a decentralized measure of virtue is what you're describing essentially. Right. Right. Amazing. Uh, like only bad people would play this game. Sorry, Jesse, what's up? I have a question. So I, I don't remember the term that you used, but it was like, Steak stealers or something like that. I don't remember exactly what you said. Um, so it, the way you described it seemed like it could be exploited. One and two. Is there a real world, like physical world analogy to it? Like, um, 
Well, it's, are, are you familiar? It's it's the classic proof, uh, nothing at stake problem. You know, proof of stake. It's a it's a an attack that you know was described academically, and it's basically a solution to that. And when you say it could be exploited, um, what it the way that it works is in order to spend someone's stake they must have tried to stake on two different chains with the same stake and won one of them they must because they you can't forge their stake transaction for the other chain but if the network sees an orphan chain go by that has a duplicate stake of the chain that actually won you know that that ends up being the chain it won't forget and it will retain that and when that matures anybody who was watching with their demon running what's called stake guard will try to spend it and somebody is going to win and so if nobody is staking on that's why we say don't stake on the same wallet on multiple machines because you're going to lose your stakes. So you just don't do that. Oh, I get, I get it now. Okay. And because if you, because if you, if you were staking on multiple um, chains on the same wallet, then you're not helping the network converge. Okay. You're not doing what I, you're supposed I, to do. I, I misunderstood what you said. Sorry. That's okay. Hi, uh, Mike. I had a question. Michael, Tarun here. Uh huh. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, you know, could you describe a little bit more how the proofs are injected into the header? Like any overheads associated with that? Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't actually. I started and I didn't finish. Yeah. So the the bottom line is this. So we started with the Zcash header, and it's got this um, thirteen hundred and forty four byte space for Equihash. And when we first started, we went to this, uh, we got sidetracked on the hash algorithm. We went to this other hash algorithm that didn't need the Equihash space. But for compatibility with Komodo and with Zcash, we left the space in there. So we just used it. So that's actually what we use for all of the merge mining and for the proof of stake, um, proof data and everything else. Okay, Wait, cool. Thanks. I heard somewhere that you could send just plain old random data, like text messages over the blockchain. Is that possible? Well, you can, you can do that. Um, so right now we actually have that built into the wallet where you can do that with Z transactions. You can send a private message that is encrypted and, uh, and with the zero knowledge uh, packet. And so the message is encrypted. If somebody can crack the AES key, then they could conceivably eventually get that message, but that's going to take, you know, long, long, long time. And, um, and yeah, you can send messages. There's a 512 byte memo for every Z transaction. Um, but we didn't put in like a programmer can send messages lots of different ways, but in the wallet, in the client, we didn't put in special ways right now of sending messages beyond. We did add, a nice easy way of including messages um, in the wallet as private memos when you're sending a Z transaction. So that that's actually really cool. Um, I so I brought up DNS earlier. I left the call and then I came back. But I brought up DNS earlier. So theoretically, that could be used as a way for DNS to work because DNS how it works now is there's kind of couple entities that control dns well, yeah so here's the thing so we have this protocol called vdxf um we haven't you know it's in the code base but we haven't it's we're using it now but we haven't like published or announced exactly how it works but it works as the code works and we will um and the vdxf basically allows you to create earls that um you know your id is kind of the root and then from there you can publish things in your ID that when you create an URL, then the VDXF allows you to um, crunch that URL down into 
uh, 20 byte uh, non colliding index that you can publish in your ID, which then maps to a 32 byte hash value, which can then reference, say, IPFS uh, or any real uh, any content store because that's part of the um, protocol. So basically, an, an ID has all of the ingredients that it needs to be a full, you know, like decentralized website or and or ID profile and everything else along with content and lots and lots more but the storage of the large media content and everything else we believe is likely to be in something like ipfs or you know maybe there will be services that will you know pin your data to the decentralized store for a monthly fee or this kind of thing but you'll be able to represent them in a self-sovereign way to every social network that will recognize your id That's so that's that's pretty interesting. So anything that needs to be verified stored on the blockchain is what you're saying. It can be either stored or referenced provably. That's that's pretty cool. Um, is is that in other blockchains like Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not unique that you can do that. But what's unique about Verus is that you can do that with IDs, and that it's a protocol that actually, you know. The, the protocol, even VDXF, everything else, it's something that other projects can and, you know, they can use, they can leverage, they could implement, and, and it would just create more interoperability. And so, um, you know, IDs may be a little bit hard, but uh, at their core, you know, everything that's going to be required for a project to implement them might be a little hard, but at their core, they're not super complex it's just kind of how they're composed and um speaking of uh of referencing um verifiably michael the snark that you guys use um is it uh kind of able to do um you know take to, to verify like a zexy snark or uh, how is it set up for in terms of dealing with like uh verified computation from like a no 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 we're doing exactly we have exactly the sapling level zk snarks same technology and same algorithms as zcash on that and so it's not like a provability a zk provability platform we're leveraging the the zk snarks that are the same um, algorithms and technology as zcash and composing them along with IDs and everything else to do things, you know, to basically use them, you know. Right. Do you um, use Halo? Uh, we, I, I'm really excited about Halo, but I uh, don't have a timetable. You know, I would expect, like, we're going to get out um, PBAS and everything else, and then I actually have to see, I have to see Halo more. I, I, I really am excited about what they're doing in it. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, there are other similar kinds of, you know, recursive ZK provable kinds of, of, um, technologies emerging and we're just going to have to see how Halo comes out with Zcash. Um, but I, I can't say like exactly how we will relate to it, except to say that I think it's really interesting. I think it could be really, I don't see any reason why we can't evolve um pbas networks once we have the entire pbas network in place i kind of expect a lot of heterogeneity evolving across the different independent projects and a common kind of you know merge mining cross-chain protocol proving everything else um stable between um systems protocol yeah, yeah the dream the dream we get it and that's kind of how I see it. And so Halo, I could envision being something that you'd have on a network, you know, on a on a blockchain in the network or on multiple blockchains or available now for new blockchains in the network, but not necessarily something that you'd have to upgrade everything to. But I assume Zcash is going to upgrade too, so there's probably a path for that too. So I'd have to learn more is what I'm Well, asking. do you know the MENA project? Yeah, you know, I, I, I know that name and I don't know... 
about it right now. I'm not. They have that. They have. That is the same kind of thing, isn't it? That is actually the same kind of thing. It's running. I'm in the test net. It's crazy. They basic. They have Halo basically, and they've tweaked it to do their own thing. I, I don't know if you if you know what what they are, but it's basically. Yeah. No. Now I remember. Yes, I did look at them. Um, it's a naked ZK rollup. They have no blockchain. Their their whole chain. Their whole quote like their whole verifiability. Their whole chain is this tiny, teeny little proof that they have this like funnel of snark work that you just push. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I mean, it would be game. great to have the Mina project join our community and, and add that to, you know, PBAS chains or, I mean, we, we'd be happy to work with them because if, because basically if that's Halo, I think I, I looked at that and it looked like Halo, but I didn't know that it actually was the same math. Um, but if that is effectively the same thing, then you know, I think there could be really an opportunity to put that on a system like this. Yeah, because I know that but they're looking we don't, at We've got to focus on getting the other stuff out first, and then that'll be just a question for next steps, you know? Right, totally. I, I know they're looking at interoperability because, like, you can... like if, well, they plug have... in, if they plug into Veris, they get... That's what I... like. Every... We're literally... Every system that will connect to Veris will be able to use that connectivity to connect to every other system. So it would seem to make sense. I think they should, we should somehow, if you're in their test net, I, I'd be happy to talk to them to, you know, but I don't have, but right now it's just a matter of, you know, right now I probably should even go. Um, right. But it's, you know, I don't really take time usually to talk about stuff that much. I'm just so heads down. And I, today I spent a little bit of time unusually you know spend time with my daughter and not necessarily just focused on coding but tomorrow i'm going right back to it and you know hopefully next week we're going to get the next rev of everything that's on its way to mainnet out on testnet and then um you know once we get through this phase and we get all of these pieces out in a release that's for mainnet i'm going to take some you know, well, actually, once it activates, then I'm going to take some deep breaths. But along that path, I'd really be happy to talk to those guys. Actually. Awesome. Well, Michael, yeah, thanks for your time, by the way. Like, uh, Nicholas, Sam, you, can, you, can, yeah. you can uh, you can always come through me and uh, or uh, as we well, well, I was going to say, I actually I'm trying to get Izzy for like the, their their like CTO guy. I'm trying to get him for an interview, hopefully tomorrow, just to talk about his political whatever because he's like the only marxist i know in the crypto space and I, that's kind of cool and so i'm, I'm definitely going to let him know and, and yeah i'll try to try to connect you folks well I, I don't know that we uh you know i mean no ico no pre-mine all that stuff you know if he's if he's got some really strong ideas about that i guess we probably don't violate anything that you know <laughs> he might um well that's also... what i want to find out i want to find out like where yeah just like how can all the, the libertarians in the space and izzy look at the same thing and say hey that's what i want well i mean it's the, the bottom line this is a human thing it's self everyone wants to be self everyone wants to have self-sovereignty we all in some way believe that we do when we and and we see that you know technology is encroaching on all of our self-sovereignty and i think that's something that humans share you know if you look at the there are you know this kind of management stuff what motivates people it's like uh autonomy what was it autonomy mastery and purpose you know and you can't have autonomy if you don't have self-sovereignty and uh and i think that we as people really do our best when when we have those things and so whether you whatever political view you have i still in all the people i know across different political views if you get down to these core things they all actually believe that those are the things that they're striving for but oh, not all maybe but most yeah i i've always thought that I, I wanted to try to explain to kind of communists why this is kind of the you know the bridge between those two worlds and so yeah i really want to grab him and like and like you know, get something out of this all right well let me know i mean i'm 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 going to be just heads down and focused, but that would be a good call, a good discussion or, you know, connection to have.
Because definitely we are interested. So I, I really do like what I see in Halo and the math that they're that they've got and what they're doing with it. I really do like that. And I and I have um, thought that that's something that we want to you know take advantage of over time. So if they've got the protocol in a way that we could integrate, that would be just amazing. Yeah, and they also have a really cool programming language called Snarky, which you may have heard of. I just heard of it. I think actually when I looked at their stuff, and I don't know about it. I don't know. I think I think I remember that was actually a way to create circuits, is what I remember. Right, They're trying to compile random stuff into Snarks. Right, yeah. which is basically what I was saying. We don't have a proving platform, and that is a proving platform. So I mean, it would be yeah. I mean, that would be pretty. I mean, that could be a reasonable. Uh, an interesting path and you know they could do their own blockchain launch using all of our technology and put that on it and, and yeah we'll want to pull it in but I mean they could they could do that and and make that system and, and be kind of the you know the center of all of that everything that technology in, in the Varus network I don't see why that wouldn't be a pretty cool thing awesome all right well, I, I don't know if there are any other really quick things that anybody has for me, but otherwise I think I'll drop off and I really appreciate all the questions and time and discussion for everybody. I, 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 ne I didn't never got to know you too well. I think you're a really cool person. I want to talk more. Um, Thank you. I, I, I didn't know that you were, you said you were some, something with Microsoft helped with the kernel. Yeah, I was a dev lead for the uh, Windows 95 kernel and did a few other things there. That's that's really amazing. Um, as, as you know, I've been helping do different things with miners on phones. Oh, yeah, actually, well, I, I, I didn't know that you were the same person, but yeah, so you did the phone miners? Mr. Bossman, yeah. Oh, cool. Kid with. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I actually just found out at one point that people were mining on phones. I was like, wow, really? Algorithms on phones now? Cool. Well, well thank you. People were doing it with other uh, currencies like Monero before. So. Yeah, but I mean, thank you. So, um, should, should we invite some of the people down in the, like, the, I don't know what this guy's name, the Guest House podcast and Natalie? They look interesting. want to bring them up here. Well, if Anyways, thanks, everybody. I'll, I'll yeah, Michael, okay. One quick thing uh, for you, Michael. Yeah. I just have to ask, what kind of coffee do you like in the morning? <laughs> or your favorite beverage? Uh, if you're asking brands and you know Seattle, Vivachi, so uh, I like coffee. And it's Eric, Eric, runs, Michael, Eric runs the coffee and crypto room in the Bitcoin Beginners uh, Tab, also uh, otherwise on the Tab. So you always ask everyone. So you ask the right guy with you. Oh, if you if you know anyone from Seattle who's a coffee aficionado, then they'll know Vivachi. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Take thanks care, everyone. Michael. Very Michael, much. Michael, thanks for everything, man. Take it Thank easy. You, you too. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Surf of the horse's mouth. We've been trying to explain that, describe it for. So, uh, yeah, hold on oh, one second, no. Mike. If you want to, if you want to leave, you you if you press the leave quietly <laughs> button on the tree sign in the bottom left. Just if you if you all think you might. We know you're British. That you think that's a victory sign and not a peace sign. <laughs>